great episode of the Elite Seller Show. Today's guest is a good friend of mine, uh, Dan Mazaros with Buy Boxer Services. He runs a fantastic agency. We're going to be talking about managing your agencies for success. So whether you're a small agency, medium size, or an enterprise agency, this is a call that you definitely want to stick to. Uh, Dan's going to be giving us his insights on how to manage clients, how he combated everything in, uh, with COVID, competition in 2021, and how to actually expand your business and grow your knowledge base, especially using ClickUp. And if you guys aren't using ClickUp, you need to get on ClickUp. This is going to be a game changer for your business. With that being said, Dan, feel free to introduce yourself and we can start this conversation, man. Yeah, well, you did uh, a great job introducing me. So what can I add to that? Yeah, I'm, um, I'm the CEO of Buy Boxer Services. We're an agency located in Utah. Um, we actually started um, as an Amazon seller, and we're a top 100 seller in the world right now, um, Buy Boxer. And naturally, with that success, people started asking us for help. And so we made the natural uh, branch off of Buy Boxer Services that is a full-service agency. Um, me personally, I've been selling on Amazon for uh, what in Amazon years is an eternity. I know. I mean, when you think of it, like Amazon's still like pretty relatively young as an e-commerce platform or as a platform in general, um, considering it's probably 20-ish years old. Um, but in, in e-commerce years or Amazon years, I've been selling on Amazon for 12 years now. So 12 years. 12 years. So it's been a long time. <laughs> All right. Just to give you guys perspective, right? The last two guests that I had on here were Brian and, and Eric Zab, uh, the Zab twins. They're 23. He's been selling for pretty much almost half their life. He's seen everything. So you were, you were on Amazon back when Amazon was still a book company. Yeah. Uh, that's actually the first product I ever sold was a book on Amazon. And, uh, yeah. Like back when I started selling, there wasn't sponsored products or anything like that. Like you just listed products and sales would happen. Be like, cool. This is awesome. This is a that's, quick that's money, money making machine. Yeah. That's as complex as it got back then. So how has Amazon changed from your experience with 12 years under your belt, man? You've, you've seen probably everything. How's it, how was it then versus uh, the wild west for, for where, where, where it is right now, where it's highly regulated? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you hit the nose on the head. I'd say the biggest, th there are two major changes that have happened in the Amazon marketplace over the, I mean, if we're going that high level, we're looking over a 12 year span, I'm going to go way up into the 40,000 foot view. And, uh, the, the, the first biggest change is the influx of sellers. When Amazon opened their doors and said, we're now any product and every product and anybody can sell on our platform. And so that was the first big wave. And now the second big wave of changes we're going through is Amazon realizing all of the negativity that came from that. There's a lot of positive that came from it. Don't get me wrong, but there was a lot of negative things that came from it as well. And now we're going through the phase of Amazon trying to clean that all up. And you're seeing that ramp up as they uh, feel pressure from antitrust uh, to, to really clean up nefarious activities that have happened on Amazon counterfeits, uh, fake reviews so much. But at that same time, uh, the, the other big change that the platform has made recently that I'm actually really for is trying to cater more to actual brands, companies, instead of just AliExpress, throw whatever you want up on Amazon. Um, so I'm, I'm really like liking the changes of where, where we're going. Yeah. So let's dive a little bit more about that uh, with the brand aspect. Uh, how does that go into competing in 2021? Because obviously when you guys first entered the marketplace, it was the wild west. There was no sellers. You pretty much got all the traction under this one, one product. And now, now like uh, in 2021, like everybody's jumping on, on Amazon, especially post pandemic or even during the pandemic. Yeah. How's your experience? Yeah, been? totally. Um, yeah. Like you said, back, back in the day, it really was, it was almost a set it and forget it platform. You could build your listings and because you were an early adopter, you benefited a lot from it. But now it's uh, it's definitely a pay to play platform. Um, I, the, the phrase that I say to my clients all the time is the real estate on Amazon is rented. And the only person that can evict you is yourself. Uh, so getting that, getting that first page real estate, man, the competition has gotten so stiff. Um, but that's where it becomes so necessary to have you know, a lot of things in place. First one, having, 
having content and optimization dialed in perfectly. Um, and then having a, a very strategic advertising strategy, strategic advertising strategy, duh. Um, <laughs> uh, that, uh, that there's just really good at defending your brand and then being able to differentiate yourself, whether that's through product features, whether that's through brand, whether that's through bundles or, or some way to really give yourself an edge to the competition is so important. Now you can't, it, you, no longer can you just say, Hey, that's a product I like, let's throw a listing up and away we go. That's interesting that you say that because obviously with the advent of FBA being rolled out, like what, back in 2014, uh, that the number of Amazon sellers that flock to that has been obviously drastic, but then also the number of me too products on the Amazon catalog has exploded. So what, what, what kind of ways do you guys find the most unique and most beneficial ways to differentiate your products to truly stand out from the herd? Let's see. What's the, what's the best way to address this question? There, there's a couple of ways that we've approached it and we've advised clients to approach it. Um, obviously, if you have a unique product, any kind of IP, like you own that. So that, that's a great way to do that. So if you're innovative and you have something that's in a product category that is innovative and you own the rights to that, yeah, let's, let's exploit that and let's tell that story. And the way that we're finding a lot of success with that right now is actually through video advertising. Um, video advertising is a relatively new uh, feature on Amazon. And I say relatively, it's been around for a little bit, but in, in terms of Amazon years, it's an, it's an infant. Um, but there, there are some major benefits to video advertising. You get to showcase your product perfectly in the best way possible. And it's free views. If you think of traditional commercials, uh, people are paying large sums of money for TV spots and uh, in, in Amazon, the views are free. People, if, if they search and your video ad shows up, that view is free. It only costs you if they click on your ad and go to your product detail page. And so you're getting a free commercial across the world's largest e-commerce e-commerce platform, uh, largely for free. Uh, so that's the, that's the best way of showing off products that are really unique. And honestly, the best way I think of showing off any product is through video. It's, uh, 80% of consumers say they have more trust in a brand if there's a high quality video that goes along with it. The other things to be aware of in competition is being really stellar at analyzing what your competition is and understanding what I call offer value. And so your offer value is a, is a function of the product that you offer, the price that you offer, how fast you can get it to them, and any other features that you add, whether it's warranties or whatnot. And obviously, Amazon levels a lot of that playing field with uh, as far as delivery times go. But what can you offer within that purchase of your product that ups your value more than the next guy? Good questions to ask yourself. Yeah, definitely. It's a good question to ask for yourself. And I, especially with Amazon sellers, I imagine one of the things that they're probably checking is uh, the review count and the negative review to positive review aspect ratio, probably getting more of their advice as to what they can fix from more of the neutral, like the two, three, and four star reviews, because they weren't the stellar five stars that could have easily been bought or the one stars that could have been left by competition. Uh, how has your business grown since uh, the pandemic? Oh man, yeah. There's, that's definitely a, a challenge that we're facing now because yeah, during 2020, there was a lot of crazy growth and it was explosive. And I, I mean, the, the only way to put it is there was, there was a serious wave of panic buying going on in the US. And so we saw a lot of sales uh, booming for our clients. And now coming into 2021, a reality is coming in as restrictions loosen and uh, you know, people are getting a little more feeling a little more safe and we're, we're kind of returning back to a normal life. Um, one of the biggest challenges we've had um, moving forward is managing those expectations with our clients of saying like, Hey, let 2021 treat it as a Christmas bonus and be happy about it. Let's compare uh, 2019 to 2021 and let that be more of our benchmark uh, so yeah, COVID, COVID was crazy. It caused some crazy buyer behaviors. We have yet to see how those, cause I, I I'm of the belief that as buyer behavior makes changes and especially one that extreme and that fast, that the new buyer behavior 
isn't going to return exactly back to where it was in 2019. We haven't seen exactly where buyer behavior is going to settle quite yet. Um, but I'm, I'm very optimistic and, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. So do you feel with everything that's gone on since the last like year and a half and everything like that, we saw the, uh, the COVID bump, right. And Amazon businesses, do you feel like things are going to start leveling back out towards 2022 or is it going to just be, uh, we're, we're still going to have these ebbs and flows that are just going to consistently pop up over time where like something crazy is going to happen and people are just going to, uh, panic buy products left and right. <laughs> yeah. I wish, I wish I could tell you if there's one thing that 2020 taught me, it was, uh, expect anything, <laughs> uh, that, that you can't really predict the future. Um, but I do think, I do think there's going to be a return to normalcy amongst buyer behavior really soon. Um, what I do think, and I, I would give this as a, as a voice of caution to any brand that's listening to this right now. Uh, don't look at your 2020 sales and think, man, 2021 is not matching those sales. What are we doing? Let's increase ad spend. Because right now, the next biggest challenge that will face the majority of e-commerce brands in 2021 is supply chain. And so I would say, hey, keep your ad spend where you're at and function where you're at. Maybe bump it up a little bit to continue driving some traffic. But get your inventory ready. Get your inventory and your supply chain in place because if you dry up out of inventory, there goes all your sales no matter what. And so I, I think supply chain issues are coming in a, in a serious way and people need to be uh, considerate and thinking of how do I plan for Q4? Cause that is what, two and a half months away now. Yeah. It's right around the corner and obviously getting your three PL set up or your fulfillment center, whether it's uh, uh, professional or, or your garage, just being able to have that in place and getting that there is going to take care of a lot of the burden, uh, especially when it comes through with IPI scores and having that proper sell through rate, proper delivery, uh, inventory valuation, inventory delivery schedule, all of that. So with your experience in Amazon, man, like 14 years, you're freaking veteran, right? You've seen everything. Where do you see Amazon going in the future? Whew, yeah, another good question. I mean, an antitrust is heating up right now, and that could lead to uh, a couple things. A, a lot of them, honestly, that I think are net positives for um, run of the mill sellers. Um, I'm hopeful that antitrust puts a target on the back of the Amazon Basics program um, because they say that it's a means to fulfill holes in uh, product categories so that the customer experience is. Uh, is complete. Well, I'm sorry, there are enough sellers of towels on Amazon. You don't need an Amazon Basics towel. There's not a hole there. And so I'm, I'm hoping that antitrust kind of uh, pokes some holes in some of the more, I don't want to say belligerent, but in, in a way it is belligerent activities towards uh, Amazon sellers. I, I hope that, that that caters more to them. Um, on the positive note, something that I do see Amazon uh, moving more towards, and we're seeing this right now, and I think this will continue to uh, will continue to see this is uh, more data specifically behind advertising. In the past, it was just what, how many impressions are you getting, how many clicks are you getting, what's your ACOS, and now we're seeing more and more ad programs being rolled out, and we're seeing the data that we can extrapolate from that being rolled out more and more. I think it was yesterday, maybe the day before a new report came out where we can finally see add to cart rates for people who land on our pages. Think of that. Amazon is the largest e-commerce platform in the world. And we're just getting add to cart data for sellers in the U S only for amazon.com. And so that's a great sign. I wish we had it 10 years ago. But that's a great sign that they're continuing to release more and more features, more and more ad types, and more and more data to sellers so that we're able to better optimize. I think we'll con continue to see that trend go way up. Uh, that's, uh, that's lovely that that bit of information actually has just been released. That's an Amazon attribution, right? The add to cart rate? Yeah. Okay. Yep. And it's, uh, it's just been, yeah, just, like I said, yesterday or the day before. 
So they're finally actually fleshing out the Amazon attribution program, which is pretty cool because I know from my experience poking around in it, that it's, it was just very basic. There wasn't really any way to actually pull anything. You could essentially create URLs and you could slap them on the tail end of whatever kind of rotator URL that you're using or any kind of uh, direct to product URL. And then that's the way that you can attribute whether or not this person actually went through the process. And conjunction to that, like if you have a Facebook pixel, you can simply just go over there and you can pixel your entire damn page. You know, you can pixel whether they click this button or that button. Did they go over here? How far did they get through the process? So that's really interesting that they're finally trying to uh, update that. And speaking of the antitrust case that's going on right now with Amazon, do you feel that Amazon's ever going to get broken up into uh, much smaller companies, kind of like the, the, the Bell companies, right? Where the telephone company got broken up into Southern Bell and then Eastern Bell, Northern, things like that. Yeah. So when it comes to antitrust, I think it will happen, but I don't think it will happen in the way that everybody expects. Um, it, don't forget that in the early nineties, Microsoft went under antitrust. And I believe that lawsuit took seven years. I'm going to have to fact check me on everything I say here. <laughs> Jim, can you um, fact check that? This fact is confirmed. <laughs> uh, but I, I think it was sev seven years the antitrust took. So first of all, the thing that I don't think people expect is how long the antitrust pr process is going to take uh, with Amazon. And then the other thing that will happen is people think, ah, oh, Jeff Bezos, he's monopolizer. We got to take him down. Guess what? If you actually break up Amazon, his net worth is going to triple overnight because in all, in all reality, amazon.com, AWS, now MGM, uh, how other many companies do they own? Twitch. It, Twitch uh, in, their, in their own right are worth billions as separate companies. And you break that up. Okay. Now, instead of being the owner of one of the largest companies on earth, he's now the owner of four or five category leaders that are all worth billions. Um, so it, it could, it could, uh, it, it will certainly have an impact, but not in what I think people want the impact to be, which is they kind of want to see Bezos tempered in a way. No, I don't think that's going to happen. That man has a vision. He's got a goal. He's obviously going to space. He's going to create a uh, an Amazon uh, Amazon fulfillment center on the moon. That's definitely going to you know <laughs> have some unique unique aspects. We'll be able to order Martians in about five ten years if he. Uh, you if he now have once free two day delivery to Alpha Centauri. <laughs> Let's do it, man. I want, I want, to, I want some, uh, some Mars sand. I want some, I want a moon rock. Uh, <laughs> but uh, obviously with your, uh, with your wealth of experience in Amazon, I think one of the most interesting aspects of this is your one, your longevity two, your ability to go through all these hoops and hurdles that Amazon has thrown at sellers over time and then persevere. And speaking of persevering through all of that, how do you actually do that for your clients? Yeah, well, I'm a, uh... You say hoops and jumps. By this time, I definitely feel like an Amazon gymnast because of all the, the hoops. Yeah. So for, for our clients, really, that's where experience comes in is because of the experience that not only I've had, but we at BuyBoxer have uh, by being one of the top 100 sellers in the world. We have over 40 clients that we serve right now. They're all in different categories, all different products. And we've, there isn't a hoop that we haven't jumped through. And so that's one of the reasons why they trust us so much is because whether you're selling a football or you're selling hand sanitizer or any product under the sun, there's a good chance we've seen it. And any compliance issues or uh, yeah, any issues at all, like we, we can handle it for you. Um, we saw a lot of that during the pandemic year because people were exploiting this new, almost germaphobic United States and rightfully, rightfully so. Um, that people were being more cautious about germs and whatnot. And so people were making ridiculous claims of products about antibacterial and this, that, and the other. And so we saw Amazon crack down hard on it and they cracked down so hard that it not only impacted people who were being sketchy about it, but also the people who legitimately sell antibacterial products uh, of the, which we have many clients in that category. And so, yeah, we, we went to bat for them and uh, made sure that products got relisted and made sure that, all the proper documentation is submitted. Uh, there's, there's so many hoops to go through, like you said, and we've, uh, we've done it all for everybody. Yeah, and you guys came out on top every single time. Now, when it comes to managing such a large client load, uh, what is the normal day-to-day -day like in BuyBoxer? Like, how do you guys take care of that? And how does somebody go and get involved with BuyBoxer? I imagine since you guys are in a premier uh, agency that you have specific requirements 
for those clients that come in? Yeah, certainly. Um, so this, that's kind of a two-stage question. So the first is how do we manage all of it? Luckily, we have dope partners like Elite Seller <laughs> that make the ma- that make the management of our clients so much easier. Um, because ultimately, as an agency, you deal in one currency, and that currency is trust. And uh, Elite Seller's reporting capabilities are so much better than anything I've seen on the market. It allows me to tell our clients exactly what they want to see and what they need to see in a super quick and digestible manner. That's the most important thing because a lot of the people that are sitting across the table from you don't understand e-commerce data the same way that we understand e-commerce data. And so you've got to be able to present it to them in a way that's, hey, it's, it's easy to read. It's easy to understand. Okay, yes, this makes sense. And because it makes sense to them, now we have trust that when we're making certain calls with their account or we say, hey, we need you to spend $5,000 more on this campaign for advertising, and this is why, Elite Seller is that in-between that paints that picture for them perfectly of like, yeah, you're right. I do need to spend $5,000 more on this campaign for advertising. Go ahead. Um, so that's that's one of, the, one of the key ways that we've uh, been able to manage such a robust client base is having a tech stack that can handle all of it. And Elite Seller is a big piece of that. Um, second part of the question was clients. How do we work with Buyboxer? Well, first we have a, a website, buyboxerservices.com. Uh, you can find our services there and you can find a nice little sheet that you fill out if you're interested in working with us. Um, we do have some specific requirements. We, we don't really dabble with newer sellers who are just getting started on the platform. Uh, we usually, our baseline threshold that we would accept is somebody who's done about 500 K at least on Amazon in one calendar year. Um, but that's the very baseline, but we're typically dealing with larger clients on the platform. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're open. We're certainly open to, uh, to consultation as well. So if you are kind of earlier in the stage and you just want a strategic consultation, I'm open, I'm here ready, ready for a call. That is true. I've actually reached out to Dan on multiple occasions. And uh, funny enough, we were talking a little bit about Dungeons and Dragons before this call even started, because that's a that's a bit of a hobby of his. And I'm a bit of a nerd, definitely a nerd. I've played a lot of uh, uh, World of Warcraft, Hearthstone, Dungeons and Dragons. So I'm going to I'm going to pivot this conversation just a little bit. Right. We're going to stay on topic. But how does Dungeons and Dragons, your experience of being a, a dungeon master, <laughs> oh, go no. into managing your, uh, managing your agency? Because I imagine like the, the ability to strategize and formulate has to, has to like come from somewhere. How does that go into play? <laughs> yep. Hey, we're going straight into nerd land right here, but trying Let's to it keep now. it relevant. I love it. Hey, no shame. I'm a nerd and I love it. Roll for initiative, a, man. Yeah, I'm a grown man and in a child's body (laughs) or is it the other way? Yeah. It's the other way around. I'm a child in a grown man's body. That's, that's what it is. There you go. Um, so for listeners who don't know Dungeons and Dragons is a game of emergent storytelling, which means nobody really knows what's going to happen. The players make the decisions and the person who has built the world is, uh, adjust the world to the decisions that the players make. And that's a lot like Amazon. Uh, we, for the most, we, the, the game has rules. The game has a structure and to the best of our abilities, we follow the rules and we follow the structure, but there's always curveballs that are thrown. And uh, we are engaged with our clients in this emergent storytelling of their brand. And what's the story we're going to tell with their brand? And uh, in a lot of ways, BBS serves as, as the dungeon master for that story and guiding, uh, guiding along the players in this, this crazy world that can throw everything at you from uh, uh, some pesky goblins up to a, a full grown meaty gold dragon. Uh, we're, we're, we're there to help you navigate it all. And even suspensions in between. Yes. Suspensions in between. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely being able to bounce back. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I figured I'd throw a curveball. you know, it'd be fun to have, uh, yeah, have yeah. because I imagine the ability to craft a story and to lead a group of people down a campaign is very similar to guiding your clients through the pitfalls, the, the, ho- the hoops, the hurdles, and ultimately uh, getting to that gold dragon, slaying that dragon, and then taking their gold. Yes. 
Yes. Taking the gold. Love it. The money. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. So Dan, I got to ask you, man, how'd you get involved in Amazon, right? Because you started obviously 14 years ago. Like what was the precipice that said, you know what, I'm just going to throw a product on there. It's going to be a book and I'm just going to see what happens. Yeah. So, so 12 years ago, sorry. Um, yeah, 12, 12 years, not 14 years. Um, yeah. What, what ultimately got started was um, <laughs> I was just, I was, I was like every other uh, millennial kid, if you will. Uh, I grew up like in the, I mean, in the very early nineties. And so, I mean, I didn't grow up with the internet in my hand. So as the internet became a thing, I was obviously very interested in everything. I remember the first product I ever sold online was actually on eBay. Um, it was a Yu-Gi-Oh card nerd life again. Um, that's, that's kind of where it all started. And then obviously Amazon came to the scene and it was like, Hey, there's this website where you can sell books. And my, uh, my dad in his office in our house just was full of books and none of them were, I mean, he probably read them all, but I certainly didn't. And there were certainly some that would collect dust. And so I just like, I wonder if I could sell this on this new book selling website. And so I just looked it up and found that the ISBNs matched. And I said, yep, I have this book and I put it up there and I, put it up for the same price that it was on there and it sold. And my mom drove me down to, no, actually, yeah, no, I think I drove. Yeah. I drove down the latest, U, the closest USPS and shipped it off. And that was how it all started. Now I can tell you, I had a very uh, similar journey into my e com space. I definitely started off on eBay and uh, some of the first products that I ever sold surprisingly were, were video games. It was, uh, I had multiple copies of, uh, uh, Metal Gear Solid 2 on PlayStation 2. And I was just an absolute fan of that series. So the first thing that I ever put up on eBay was uh, a copy of Metal Gear Solid. I still actually have a couple back at home in, in Florida. Uh, they're collector's editions, obviously still sealed in the package and whatnot. Going to save those for eventual kids or grandkids, maybe one day. Uh, but the ability to tap into this e-com space and then obviously uh, mushroom out over time because you saw the success, you know, the, the bulb, it was like a light bulb moment for you that you could take a simple something as a Yu-Gi-Oh card. I imagine it was probably like a Blue Eyes White Dragon or a Dark Magician. For those of you that are listening, yeah, there you go. Uh, and then be able to sell that on, uh, on, on eBay and then actually make a markup, put in like a little bubble mailer and make sure it's, you know, in a proper sleeve that's protected, doesn't have any boxing around the corners, and then just be able to sell that off and then get money for it, right? It's just like, yeah. holy shit, this, this is happening, right? Yeah, and if you, if you fast forward the clocks way forward, um, I played an integral role in building what is now the largest home and kitchen brand on Amazon a brand that sells all sorts of bedding supplies and anything that you can find in your house. And that brand did 450 million this year on Amazon. Like there's a, it, there's a big difference between a dark magician on eBay and hundreds of thousands of dollars per day in sales. Well, maybe if it was a misprint dark magician or something like that with a reverse holo <laughs> and double sided Dude, collectors a... items right now online are going crazy. So I'm going to talk about a hot market. conversation back into the Amazon space. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's steer the conversation back in the Amazon space. Uh, where do you see Amazon going with the ability for manufacturers directly in China to be able to ship their products into Amazon and essentially cut out all the middleman in between? Like, what are your thoughts on that? And what do you think Amazon should do in regards to cracking down? I don't think they're going to change it. It's too too big of a cash cow for them. Um, yeah, I, I wish they would change it, but last year, 75% of new sellers on Amazon were Chinese. Um, so yeah, will they do anything? When you're taking 15% of every sale, it's hard to turn down as many sales as you're getting from China. So I don't, I don't think they're going to make any changes. Um, if, if anything, they'll continue as we as we realized last month with the shutting down of um, Aki and one other brand, which are like two of the largest consumer electronic brands on all of Amazon. Um, they cracked down on some false reviews and review manipulation, and they just kicked those two sellers off the platform. So that's the only way that I really see them taking any sort of action. 
And I think that that action will very much be save face action instead of actual, we care about getting, uh, getting seller, getting mass amount of sellers that are maybe not engaged in the most honest activities off of the platform. Um, so if, I mean, if, if, but I mean, that's, that's the, the great thing about a marketplace. I mean, there's nothing, nothing wrong with Chinese sellers selling on the marketplace as long as they're following the rules. Um, and so I, yeah, I don't see them cracking down on anything unless they, they break any, uh, significant Amazon rules. So speaking of following the rules, what's the most egregious thing that you've ever seen a seller or sellers do, uh, in terms of violating TOS? <laughs> you have opened a can of worms, man. Um, oh my, oh my gosh. So back in the day when review manipulation wasn't monitored, there were entire companies that existed for the sole purpose of paying people to negatively review competition. Some of that still exists today, but it's, it's definitely less, but I have seen hundreds of reviews be placed that are all one stars um, against sellers who, you know, their product really isn't that bad. They just, there's just a company paying them to, to give them negative reviews. So yeah, that's, that's probably one of the dirtiest things I've, I've seen anybody do carry out against another seller. Um, yeah. And then obviously fake product. It happens all the time. That's the biggest, that's the biggest threat right now to, to Amazon is, uh, is fake product. You've seen a ton of features being released, uh, over the last little bit to, to try and combat that. Okay. Yeah obviously review manipulation that was rampant when I started selling on Amazon back in 2016. You know, it's like the thing to do, it was quite literally taught to me is just, Hey, reach out to a group on Facebook and uh, you can essentially purchase some reviews uh, from there. And you can like, you, you buy your reviews and you would obviously give them a discount, but then they would leave that review and it'd say, I, re I, I received this product in regards to get uh, in regards to compensation, like kind of a disclaimer. And then Amazon would just do the review purge and essentially clean slate everybody that, uh, that had any kind of that language in there, or if they saw a massive spike in reviews in a very short time period for a new, newly launched product, you know, it's like getting a hundred reviews and 60 days is crazy uh, when you come to think of it. So with, with, with obviously that crackdown happening uh, a long time ago on Amazon and then currently happening now, uh, what would you, what would you tell new sellers navigating the platform, the best way to actually uh, to, to stay within TOS and how to make sure that they're uh, that they have like a successful future in the Amazon game? Uh, yeah, not that I'm biased at all, but hire an agency. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hire an agency that can help you help you navigate all of that. Um, but no, the, the, the thing that new sellers should know starting out on the platform is do not skip skimp on content and SEO out of the gate. You've got to have that number one. Um, I mean, seven images that are beautiful. If it, if it tells, if it costs you a little money to spend a little extra on a nice photographer, do it, uh, do your, uh, do your uh, keyword research, which can be done by elite seller. You can go in there and you can pull in uh, what's called a reverse ace and lookup and put all of your competitors in there and see exactly which keywords that they're ranking on and get ready to build your content in a way that hits a lot of those top keywords and the ones that you want to rank for. You can't skimp on that when you're, when you're a brand new seller. Um, so that, that's what I would say would be the, the first step to, uh, to success if you're brand new. Well, we definitely appreciate the shout out on that. Uh, so in your experience uh, of navigating all these brands, what do you see as the most competent way uh, of, of, of navigating all this? And then on top of that, uh, where do you see within those companies that you're managing the most, what, se what separates the most successful companies from the unsuccessful ones? Mm. So good question. Um, our, our most successful brands do all of the right things consistently over long periods of time. Um, and that's, I mean, the right there is 20,000 points that I just opened up of like, what are all, what are all the right things? Um, but I can surmise that into a, a couple buckets. So are you focused on content and optimization? Do you have a good advertising strategy? Are you able to stay in stock? 
Um, if you can do those, that's really Amazon 101. If you can do those three things consistently over long periods of time, you will rank and outrank your competition and you will see the Amazon flywheel take effect and you'll start seeing a ton of sales. Okay. So obviously tightening up your uh, supply chain, being sure that that's the most important pivotal part of the Amazon machine for your business, uh, making sure that you have quality content, uh, really high, high res images, uh, really sharp bullet points, uh, loaded with keywords, uh, plenty of, uh, obviously doing your research using lead seller or any other platform out there. Again, this is just a podcast and uh, making sure that, you know, if, if you need to relying on a community. So where has buy boxer tied into the Amazon community space? Because I know that you guys technically only exist on your own website and like I can find you on LinkedIn. How do you guys reach out to the community at large and, and provide any kind of uh, like benefits and help? Yeah. So the best place that you can uh, find our content is uh, actually through our website. We have a blog. And then in addition to that, our founder, Scott Needham, um, is very large in the space. Um, he has his own podcast, Smartest Seller in the Room um, is, his, is his podcast. And that's the, that's the best way to stay in touch with uh, the value that uh, BuyBoxer adds to the community. Because like you said, it's a, it's a tight-knit community. I feel like uh, all Amazon sellers kind of know each other and, and not in any kind of animosity sort of way. It's like, Hey, we're just, we're all here just getting gold from the goose that lays the golden egg and we're loving it. Yeah. We're all on the same journey, man. You know, some people may be an archer, some people may be a rogue or a paladin. Some may be a white knight, red mage or a, a black mage, but we're all on the same path. We're all on this journey to obviously have a wonderful lifestyle for either ourselves or our families or to be able to pass down like a, a wealth generating machine for our extended families and, and, and just grow a business. So Dan, obviously you've definitely, I've said this multiple times that you've been in the Amazon game for a long time. What are your, what are your thoughts when it comes to the rise of aggregators in this space? Because they just started popping up like, like several years ago and now they're all over the place. And have you ever sold a brand yourself it being that you've been on the platform for 12 years? Yeah. So I actually personally have never sold a brand to one of these new aggregators. That doesn't mean it won't happen in the future. Um, the aggregator space is, is awesome. I love it. Um, because I mean, you look at, you look at Thrasio, for example, they are the fastest company to a profitable billion dollar valuation in the history of the United States. Um, and then there's how many other aggregators similarly like them that are uh, getting funding money at ridiculous multiples. And it's awesome. Um, I like it because it brings att more attention to the Amazon space uh, because this is the space where I make a living. And so it's a, it's a good, pl good place to be. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's awesome. Um, I, and I, I honestly force, I foresee these Amazon FBA aggregators becoming what in our minds previous is like a Procter and Gamble. They're, they're the next, the, the Amazon aggregators are the Procter and Gambles of the future where Procter and Gamble owns how much shelf space across every single product that we buy in a grocery store. These aggregators are now going to become the virtual shelf space owners. How much of the product out there that we see belong on Amazon belongs to Thrasio? I have no idea. But they're taking up uh, real estate but I bet you it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so Dan, just to finalize everything, you came from the, as an Amazon seller, just starting off, and then you migrated over into running your own agency. What would you have to say to Amazon sellers that are at that capacity to essentially help other Amazon sellers in that space, either with management or with services? How would you say that the best way for them to transition that and scale their business? Hmm. Yeah, excellent question. Um, so the best way to do that, hmm. honestly, so if, if you're a successful Amazon seller right now, considering the transition, there's a high likelihood that your tech stack is already set in place, um, to manage your own seller account. And so I would look directly at the resources that you currently have and see if there's a way to just expand that to one client. Just go get one client and say, hey, I'd like to, 
I'm a successful Amazon seller. I'd love to manage your account for you. Here's the success I've had. Here's the confidence I have in my ability to, uh, to manage your Amazon and see if plugging that one client in not only functions, but uh, doesn't break the system and allows you, and that might give you a good idea of, yeah, I think I, I think I could maybe scale this thing. And, uh, and then, and then the, the second piece to that, once you get to the, the scaling aspect becomes how do you differentiate yourself? Uh, because there are, there are a ton of agencies out there and service-based businesses are, there's no better, there's no easy way to put it. Service-based businesses are nigh to impossible to, to differentiate because I manage Amazon. Okay. So do 30 other companies. And so, yeah, what, what makes you stand out as, uh, as an agency? And that's something that you're going to want to define really early on in the process um, because that's a horse you can ride all the way to the finish line. If you, can, if you can properly dial in your differentiation and then the sales and marketing tactics that go behind that to acquire new clients and keep them happy. So um, we're going to wrap it up with this final question. And obviously, uh, with Amazon being as successful as it's been over the years and rolling out into multiple different marketplaces and expanding across the world, where, what company would you say would be the next Amazon in comparison? Is it a company that nobody's heard of or is it one that's already existing? Like, where would you say is the, the best duplicatable process for another company that sellers uh, would be able to easily move their products to on a different platform? Yeah. Um, there are certainly a lot of people that are trying right now and I don't, I don't see it happening with anybody who currently doesn't exist. Uh, Cause there are five to six companies right now that I can think of that are, uh, that just have the capital and the resources to become the next one. And I believe if they can plug, cause where, where Amazon really, really made their gains is not because they're the most beautiful website, not because they're the most easy to use, but because they have the best distribution network. That free two-day shipping with Prime changed the game. And so I think the, the company that has the most likelihood to mimic that and build an ecosystem that could even hold a candle to Amazon is Shopify. I think they've got the best shot say Shopify. And it's also gives the, uh, the control, uh, back to the seller because that's the yep. beautiful thing about Shopify is that their fees are a whole lot less. You can have essentially your own curated store that matches your client's needs and wants, and you can actually get more engagement and direct feedback and you can tie it into yep. a multitude of facets, obviously your Facebook page, your website, uh, your Instagram, maybe even TikTok later on, if they ever roll that integration out, who knows, but to, yeah. to be able to, it, it I would have to agree with you on that because I've dealt with a lot of Amazon sellers that have active, that have active Shopify stores and they find that they don't make nearly as much as they do on Amazon, but the customer satisfaction is through the roof. Right. And oh, then yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. the inverse on Amazon. They make a crap ton, but their reviews never really break 4.4 on Shopify. They're a 4.9 across the board for all their products and everybody loves them. And they can offer unique uh, promotional offers and bundles that uh, can only exist on that, on that platform versus releasing them on Amazon. And they have a, much yeah. higher engagement rate, uh, especially the fact that they can actually own that audience while Amazon still technically is just uh, a place where you can put your products up, but they technically own the audi audience at the end of the day. Yeah. So, so, so imagine if you could have that level of control with the fulfillment capabilities of Amazon, that would be a powerful company. And that's something that I don't like, why has Amazon not realized that? Like just give us the same level of control and capability that Shopify has on your platform and you guys will be unbeatable more than you already are because you already are kind of unbeatable. <laughs> Dan, it's been a pleasure having you here on uh, the Elite Seller Show. If you guys want to reach out to Dan with Buy Boxer Services, that's, you can head on over to their website, buyboxerservices.com. You can even uh, try to message Dan on LinkedIn if he, if he, if he, if he checks his messages over there. Uh, Dan, it's been a pleasure having you on here and uh, having you share your knowledge, your wealth of knowledge in the Amazon space. Uh, make sure that you head on over to EliteSeller.com. Afterwards, sign up for your 14-day free trial. Make sure you use the code JOSH15 for 15% off for life and start managing your business like the CEO that we know that you are. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, Dan. Thanks for having me. No problem, man.